Good afternoon and welcome to The Road to Recovery, The Road to Freedom with Mark. And yes indeed it is the afternoon, Friday the 16th of July on the time of this recording and uh, it's been a, another tough week, another long tough week and in fact very many years of, of struggle for me and my show is about mental health, mental health issues, that's what I deal with, uh, dealing with my, my personal experiences and my struggle, which has basically been a lifetime of struggle, and um, it's not just about things that people suffer from and, and how to deal with them, it's also about society and the concepts of what creates these problems, and the world is full of them, full of problems. In recent times, there's been quite a few shootings, people running around with guns, poking them in people's faces and shooting cops and a lot of violence and lawlessness in society which has really upset a lot of people and got a lot of people afraid and has had a detrimental effect on a lot of people's mental health and in a lot of ways you know it creates fear and uncertainty in society those poor people who were subjected to to all of those horrors um things I'll never forget in their lifetime and it's very important that we all feel safe and secure in our country and that's not you know not because we have a brutal regime that is cruel to those who break the laws of of that regime that's not what we want we don't want to see this descend into what's happened in, in Africa and more importantly more recently in South Africa and my show is dedicated today to my friends in South Africa, and I do mean all of my friends of all colours and all races. And I'm not just talking about black South Africans and white South Africans. There's many, many, many other people there as well. There's loads of Indians there. There's, there's Muslims live in Africa, South Africa. There's, it, it's very diverse. Cape Malays. There's all kinds of people live there. It's not just a black and white, right and wrong, yes and no situation. That's an oversimplification of a situation born of ignorance. Once you get to know the place, you realise what a diverse, socially diverse place it is, what an incredibly beautiful, wonderful, wonderful country that place is. Absolutely magnificent. That little piece of my heart will always be there. And I feel so bad for those who got left behind. I'm almost crying talking about this, you know. I'm, pictures of people's faces are, are going through my mind as I'm talking about this and you know the people I had to leave behind a long long time ago as, as my life moved on but unfortunately um, as I say those people are, are going through hell right now and it's because of corruption and, and lawlessness which is always prevalent in Africa because the rest of the world is too slow to respond and does too little to help people and therefore they allow a vacuum which is filled inevitably by the armed forces and often you find that generals who basically have control of armies tend to take over countries or have control or significant influence in these countries and everything is um, corrupted by these people um, these people's lust for power um, you know ultimate power ultimately corrupts and corrupts ultimately that's what it is it's all unfortunately and the suffering is unbelievable you know it if you witnessed it it would tear you to pieces it would take an extraordinarily strong person as in spiritually strong to be able to even witness it and, and, and come away without being damaged forever I certainly was and, and always will be and I, I hate to see these sort of things happening to people like that we on the other hand living at the bottom of the world here have a relatively safe society so I guess if we compare ourselves to some of the other poor souls in this world we haven't got it so bad 
But we don't do a very good job, let's be honest. We could do a lot better, and especially when it comes to looking after the mental health of everybody in this country. We're going through extremely stressful and tough times right now with this pandemic. We see this thing breaking out, and believe you me, she's still in full flight. Despite um, vaccinations, we find that places like Thailand and Indonesia right now are going through absolute explosions, over 1,000, 1,100 people a day um, falling victim. And unfortunately, the most vulnerable, the poorest in this world, will be the last to get the vaccinations. So by the time the world slowly, slowly, slowly rolls around, five years down the track, we might start to see some degree of vaccination. Well, five years is too late. This Delta variant has proved itself to be so infectious that herd immunity in many countries is the only way out of this that is to say those who die well too bad those who suffer mm, too bad for you too because those vaccinations are never ever ever going to roll out in time and before i started the show i was talking to michael and talking about learning to accept the things that you cannot change it doesn't mean that we should be silent about it but we cannot necessarily help those people in southeast asia africa and south america who have fallen way behind um way behind the play i mean bolsonaro and in 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 brazil and all of that i mean that's it's it's, it's shambles it's disgraceful how some of the politicians have reacted so slowly donald trump was another one a, a denier of a pandemic that was right at his doorstep and look what happened a lot of people lost their lives unnecessarily because they were too slow to react a country that has the organisation and the ability to react swiftly, unfortunately, indulged in false news and lies and nonsense and still loads of people are living in denial that vaccination is going to help them. Well, the fact is it will. It will stop people from dying or prevent a lot of deaths. So let's... Um, dispel this conspiracy theory nonsense about how the government is trying to control you through a pandemic it's, it's rubbish it's nonsense you know the more people that we can get vaccinated the safer this country is going to be so i implore everyone and anyone who can if you've got people who are doubtful about it just tell them to check the facts to be sure for themselves to do their research so they're sure in their hearts and their minds this is the way to go to protect each other as a community and let's face it we live in the pacific we are islanders living in aotearoa we are part of the pacific which means that we have a responsibility to our polynesian and melanesian brothers and sisters all the way up to the solomons and papua you know rarotonga nua fiji Sama, everyone deserves protection and we need to get in and help our Polynesian brothers and sisters. We are intricately linked to these folks. They are part of our lands and we are part of theirs. We live together in this ocean and we must look out and protect each other. So we need to get as many vaccines as we can to as many of those islands as possible to look after these folks who are very, very vulnerable to these types of pandemics. You know, a lot of the time, because of their lack of exposure to the rest of the world, they end up extremely vulnerable to outbreaks like this. And they don't have the setup. They don't have the facilities. These countries are relatively poor. They don't have big setups. And because they live on islands, it's very, very hard to get from place to place to place. They don't have helicopters, Hueys, where they can just jump from island to island. They don't have big hospital setups. They don't have a lot of doctors and nurses. But we do. And that's where we have to get in and give assistance. But also... We need to have some common sense instead of just chucking diseased people into motels and hope they don't jump the fence and infect everyone in town. We have to have proper quarantine facilities. We have needed these from the get-go. It's been far too long now. We've been far too slow to react. We've muddled and stumbled around and learned and failed as we went. And that is not good enough. 
when the pandemic broke out at the end of the Second World War, what they called the Spanish flu, they quarantined people on places like Soames Island and Wellington. And unfortunately, some people are buried up there who died from that pandemic right up on the top if you care to go and look at their gravestones. It's sad, but... You know, it did protect society, and when the the last great plague um, broke out, the bubonic plague of 1666, or at least in London, it was, uh, you know, around the time of the Great Fire, the two years previous, it was the pandemic swept through England, and the one before that in Holbein's times in the 1100s. In both cases, the only way that people were able to survive those pandemics was to isolate themselves, and there were villages that locked themselves away for two and three years as the pandemic swept across Europe, and that was the only way that they were able to keep themselves safe. No one in, no one else. Isolate. And that's what New Zealand should have done from the start. The the lessons of history are there for us to read in black and white and say, oh, that's how they protected themselves. There we go. There's the answer. We should have shut our borders for a year, minimum. I say two, no one in, no one out unless absolutely necessary. No holidays abroad, no frivolous nonsense. Look at what you have to lose for the sake of a little bit of entertainment. There's, why can't you go on holiday here in New Zealand and spend the money? And guess what? Because of COVID, lots of people have travelled round Aotearoa and said, what a magnificent place this is. There's so many special places, little unknown places now. For the last 20 years, I've been going around to these spots and I've been sitting on the beach catching snapper with not another soul in sight, and maybe one or two. I went to Ocean Beach not that long ago in the long weekend and um, to ferry. <laughs> there were a hundred people fishing there where there used to be about five of us. It's nice to see everybody getting out with their kids and experiencing the outdoors and walking down the beach in the ocean and that's great for people's mental health not just for 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 adults but for children as well to get out in the open doors and leave the the tablets and their phones behind and get out and see nature and and learn how fun it is how much fun it is to get out there you know, kids forget quickly they get distracted by the latest and greatest thing and that's where it's very important for the adults of the family to have family time together and that doesn't mean all playing on on, on playstation that means actually getting out and walking together and talking together and eating together and being a family together and the other concept that I like is that you give kids rewards points, right? And these rewards are how much time you can spend on your little play things if you do a few chores around the house. So it's this concept of earning a reward. And children buy into this so easy. That's the way to get them off those stupid damn phones is if they unload the dishwasher, they get an extra 30 minutes playing later on. And it gets kids into doing the chores that are expected of them, but also going that little bit further to gain a reward. And and this is a, a wonderful concept in training children about um, effort and reward, about doing something and earning something. And if something is earned, it is enjoyed so much more. I tell you what, beer is beer until you've done a hard day's work on the end of a shovel and grunted it out for eight hours, sweating buckets, that first beer you have, <laughs> it's the best beer you'll ever have in your world. A nice cold beer, and you know you've earned it. It's been well earned, and that's what makes it so good. Not the fact that it's cold, and not the fact that it's beer, but you're so knackered, and you've earned that beer, and you feel the um, endomorphins, the, the dopamines kick in, and you get a, a physical buzz out of the idea your brain actually tells you here's your reward here's your dopamine here's your little buzz for doing something that was good and you've earned it and it's not just the beer it's not just the cold beer it's your brain and your body rewarding you for having done something good and that concept is true of all things well earned you know
I remember so many times saying to myself, I deserve this, I deserve this, for the effort that I put in, and and this is a good way to to break out of this negative cycle that you get into when you're depressed, is to strive for something. That's the hardest part, is to take that first step and begin to make progressive steps towards a win. And once you've got that win, you think, I deserve this. And your mind and your body reward you. And so your perspective starts to change as you achieve things, earn things, and get rewards for your efforts. What tends to happen is your natural tendency when you're suffering from depression is to do nothing because that's the easiest thing to do is do nothing lie on the couch curtains drawn watch tv is that ever going to improve anything no the likelihood is it's it's only going to get worse you know it's only going to grind and grind and grind away until this becomes your every day and you never put your head up but once you start down that path of success little little wins not great big impossible wins that you're never going to get to you strive your whole life and fail 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 and beat up on yourself when you do i'm talking about small achievements even even just doing all the dishes and clearing the decks and having it clean and sitting back with a cup of coffee and you feel so much better not being surrounded by shite all the time. And I, I'm very guilty of doing that, of just leaving dishes and saying, oh, I'll get round to it, and of course I don't. And it always annoys me that there's, you know, dirty stuff on the bench. And every now and then I go, right, and I roll my sleeves up, and I just spank the whole lot till it's sparkling. And it's the only time I feel good about my kitchen. It's hard to do. I'm not saying it's easy. But every now and then I do it, and I think, geez, I'm glad I did that. And a lot of the time, doing something is a lot easier when you're actually doing it than, than what you're thinking it's going to be. You're thinking, oh, it's going to be so difficult and this and that, and a lot of negativity. But once you start on a positive thought, positivity breeds positivity. Negativity, it breeds negativity. So it's all about getting that positive attitude, about being mindful. This is what I've been taught. What I espouse here is nothing to do with concepts I've come up with. These are things I've learned from other people over the years and thought about them and developed things and learned how to get better. It doesn't just fall out of the sky. The most important thing is that you talk to people and not just some mate down the road. I'm talking about professionals who have seen this a thousand times before, who know how to find solutions, help you. Because everybody's journey is different. You know, there's no textbook that can tell you one, two, three, four, five steps and you're done. It's not like that. It's learning to be mindful, first of all, learning to appreciate the small things in life. Instead of dwelling on the negativity, think about the good things that you do have. And try to develop those good things rather than get on that negative I can't, I can't, I won't, I shan't, I don't, no, 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 stamp your feet and, and just sit in the darkness. As soon as you say I can, you allow yourself the opportunity and it is allowing yourself the opportunity even if you don't take it. You say I can instead of I can't and all of a sudden the door opens. Now you've got the opportunity to step forward. I can do something about my situation. I can make it better. Now, finding help is not easy, as you know, and people like Mike King, you know, I've seen the poor guy in tears on TV, so frustrated because he has the people ready to help the young folks, and rather than pick up the people at the end of the line who are broken, like vaccinate people who are nearly dead anyway, I say when it comes to mental health at least, Look after those young people who are going through a terrible time at the moment. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of false news and nonsense because of the nature of social media. So young people, they don't have the experience, so they need to know where to go to get the good oil, to rely on people who do have the experience and to learn. And as they learn, they can help their peers. And it's all about peer support, about 
young people helping young people, not just looking up to older ones and saying, ah, oh, feed us the crumbs of knowledge. It's about empowering young people to help each other and say, we're all in this together. We are a community. And this is where I hark back to Arrow Radio and the Lights, Wire Rapper TV, being part of a community that is attempting, at least, to assist each other. The food bank, just a few doors down from us, doing wonderful work. Now, these people could be spending their time earning money for themselves, getting a a flasher car and nicer clothes and a better house, and they'd be very, very successful at what they did. They're thorough and they're professionals, but they don't do things like that. They work in a poorly paid job in a community radio station because they believe in what they do, because they have some decency about them. They're caring people who realise that there are those of us in society who are silent because we're made that way, because we don't have an opportunity, a platform to have a voice. And this is where I'm very grateful to be able to talk to people and give an alternative point of view. You know, what I say you're never going to hear on the 6 o'clock news, you're never going to hear from the media, from any politician or anyone in an institution or any form of authority. You will not hear these sorts of things from them. What you'll hear from them is lies and platitudes and manipulation and bullshit all of the time. That's how they make a living. But those people who care about this, what do I get paid? What's my incentive? I get nothing. What I get is a sense of self-satisfaction that I've at least attempted to help other people who have suffered as I've suffered and perhaps make life a little bit better and a little bit easier for other people. That's my motivation, to help those in my immediate community, in the wire wrapper and in the beautiful Hawke's Bay up there and, and out on the carpety on the west coast there, all of those folks who tune in now to Arrow, it's about us. It's about our community and assisting each other to live a better life and to be happier, to, you know, appreciate the rivers and, and, and the forests and, and the ocean and the beaches and the sea, to, to really realise that you are part of this. This is part of, of what you are physically, emotionally, spiritually. It is part of you. And the more you engage, the more you engage in society, the more you help rather than push in front of somebody, step back and let them in. Say thank you like you mean it. Don't say have a nice day and just some nasty platitude that you trot out as if to say, I don't care about you. Well, you don't. When you speak like that to me, it's, it's condescending. You know, it really is. You make me feel like I'm unimportant. And I turn around and I say, do you thank you? I appreciate that. And people look at me like they're shot. So I'm actually talking from the heart and saying something that I mean. If you say thank you, mean it. Don't, this is not to be discarded. The more consideration we show towards each other, the more we assist each other, the better life becomes. And we live in a great country now, but we live in a country very much divided down racial lines and religious lines. You know, Muslims in this country are... are, are are treated like Martians, you know, they're strangers and different and they eat funny food and all this nonsense. I used to hear this when I was a child, oh, they eat funny food, they smell, oh, they're different. You know, you can look at those tiny, skin-deep differences between people or you can see the enormous amount of similarities that we have. We're 99% the same and 1% different, and yet it's the 1% that everyone concentrates on instead of the 99% us the same, all of us. It really is irrelevant, you know, what what package you come in a brown paper bag or a white paper bag mate they're just paper bags it's just skin it's just skin deep i have a heart the same as you my blood runs red just like yours i care like you do i i love the kids and i hope for their futures just like you we're all the same all of us there is no difference really there are those minor insignificant differences we are in one walker all of us together, and if we paddle in opposite directions, where are we going to go? Nowhere. We'll sit in that wooden hole and starve to death. But if we move as one, we paddle together, looking forward, driving forward, 
the more we cooperate, the faster we go, and the greater chance we have of achieving our targets if we work together. A society divided is a society destroying itself. The more kindness and consideration and simple little things we show towards each other, the happier this place becomes. You know, I still go to small towns. I like small towns. I don't like big places now. I like little places. I like to go to a town where you're walking down the street and people say, look you in the eye, and they say, g'day. I don't know you. They're strangers. How nice. How nice is it for someone to say good day to you? You know, just that, that little bit of community that says, you know, I see you. You're a human being. I do actually care about you. That is so nice. The tighter people are packed together, the more indifference they treat each other with. I've lived in big cities, Paris and London and places like that, and people push, 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 okay? But you go to somewhere like Tokyo, a city of 38 million people, people don't just shuffle and shove. They actually have people hired to push you, physically shove everybody on the trains, that's how much indifference they treat each other with and it's not that they're evil people they're good people but they're so jam-packed that they don't have the time to treat each other with consideration they have their noses rammed in someone else's armpit in the train and they look the other way as if you don't exist if you go on a train in paris or london in the underground people don't look at you they don't talk to you and if you talk to someone they treat you like you're some kind of bizarre alien they look away. They pretend that you are not there. They know that you're there. They can see you out the corner of their eye, but they steer away and pretend that you don't exist. You get into a smaller community. The smaller the community, the more they know each other, the more they care about each other. Until you get down to the level of a town or a village where people actually go out of their way to help each other. So the less stress there is and the closer people are, the more kindness they show. So what we've got to do is we've got to realise that people in cities need to show a little bit more kindness towards each other because it is more difficult when there's stress and there's pressure. Don't, don't tailgate people. Don't push and shove. Don't shove in front of somebody and jump and queue. You know, those sort of things erode the decency in society. You show a little bit of care and kindness and consideration and just be genuine and honest. You don't have to be all nicey-nice when you're not feeling that way. And it's also okay to be angry. It's okay just to, just to shout and scream and go nuts sometimes, just every now and then. Don't subject others to it if you can possibly avoid it. Just go and scream at a tree or something and let it out. Don't bottle things up until the point where you just full of fury and anger and negativity because when you're negative that has a ripple effect on the rest of society and when you're positive you'd be amazed what a ripple effect that can have you know I whenever I'm driving if I see someone waiting to get into the road right they're at a t-junction and they're wanting to get in and we're all nose to tail nose to tail nose to tail I stop and I let them in even if I have to flash my lights and wave them in because they're half asleep, daydreaming, you know. I let them in. What does it cost me? Two seconds. I think I could spare two seconds. Just a little bit of kindness is what I'm asking for now from everybody so that we can come out of this pandemic a better society. You know, there is... If you look at the the OECD statistics for things like um, suicide and, and, and mental health problems, we're one of the highest in the world. And yet we live in such a magnificent country. It shouldn't be that way. And the only reason it is that way is because of our society. If our society was better, there'd be fewer, fewer people topping themselves. So it all starts at school. Instead of looking at how many we can reject and how many failures we can make, we've got to look at how we can make each person the best them. Instead of saying, well, if you don't fit, we'll knock the sharp edges off you, boy, because that's what they used to say to me. And then they'd whip me. And I do mean whip. I got 36 sessions of beating from school alone in my first year. I hate to think how many thrashings I got when I was 13. Uh, 
A hundred? Probably. Somewhere in that. Somewhere around there. And it didn't make me better. It made me angry. It made me destructive. It made me negative. It made me a bully. It made me hurt people because I was being hurt unnecessarily. Knocking the sharp edges of somebody is not the way to develop a human being. Find the skills and abilities. Promote them and dispel the negative not by pushing it down, but by informing people so that they're not as ignorant. Most prejudice, slant and bias is born simply of ignorance. And once people learn, hey, all of a sudden their attitudes change because they're aware, they're informed. They make good decisions based on fact instead of somebody else's prejudice. You know, don't trust that person because they're a different colour. Oh, come on, we're better than that. All of us are better than that. Nobody needs to be that way. You know, prejudice is born of ignorance. Indifference is born of ignorance. All you need to do is find out the facts. Just the facts. Not the opinions or anything else. Right, well, that's me for another day. Half an hour gone in the blink of an eye. I just want to say thank you very much to Arrow Radio, to Michael and Veronica for allowing me to do this show, to um, Wairapa TV for coming on board and, and turning on a great show and for all the sponsors who support this radio station because I wouldn't be here without any of those people. I owe them everything as far as the show is concerned and, and personally I owe them a lot too. So I want to say thank you very much to everyone and especially to the listeners who tune in. I hope you spread the good word and I, I hope you do something special this week for somebody and that would really that'd be a damn good thing. So thank you very much and um, we'll catch you all again next week. Bye for now. Cheers. <laughs>